And now the uh, the breathing the breathing computer will begin. <laughs> um, hi, it's Trent. This is Maps. I don't know. It's a funny name, but we're we'll, we'll working with it. Um, today I I've been kind of like jumping around thinking of a bunch of different things to do. Um, so, uh, the general outline that I'm thinking about is that we're gonna do... Um, I wanna start by kinda doing like a brief, like, a little, like, cold mac explanation or like walkthrough. Um, and we're gonna do that by like basically recreating it with Crow, um, or like the elements of it with Crow. Um, that's the start. Then, um, I also want to talk about the, the span circuit, um, which is very similar to the intone control in some ways, uh, on just fans. Um, but specifically looking at three sisters and how it does the kind of, um, moving three filters with uh, two controls and this idea of having a small number of inputs that have uh, kind of further reaching uh, effects um, yeah. so we'll do that. and then basically in the probably in the second hour I kind of want to get into um, there's a couple ideas. I part what I, one thing I want to do is um, show how incredibly simple and quick it is to do to implement chaotic al algorithms on Crow. Um, but also I want to look at like the idea of um, kind of creating your own utility modules, creating uh, creating other sets of one or two inputs to a, a number of outputs. Um, because I think that there's a lot of uh, kind of interesting things you can do there and you can make uh, musical gestures, I think, a lot more ac uh, accessible in a live context if there's only one or two, a small number of parameters. Maybe, maybe two is not enough to do the whole thing, obviously, but um, I think sometimes when you boil stuff down like that, you can get these really interesting performative gestures and it can become, uh, I don't know, a more kind of tactile experience um, when you're performing because you're not so worried about breaking things or it's easier to know what turning a certain control is going to do or what a certain control voltage is going to um, have as an effect. Um, that's an idea. So let's, we'll, we'll think about that. So creating your own one to many utilities. But also, um, I wanted to say, like, one thing I'm really excited about uh, with Crow is that you can kind of make it be a lot of things. So if anybody has um, certain kinds of... Um, is that a dog barking? Maybe I'm imagining it. Um, if there's certain kinds of utilities, if there's a certain module that you're really interested in that you wish you could understand more, that you wish there was like some way of uh, kind of exploring what it would be like to use that, and that does, doesn't have to be a Eurorack module. It can be kind of any any processor that focuses on triggers and CV and modulation in general. Um, yeah, let me know. Let, let me know in the comments. Like, do the at Trentley. Um, so I'll get. So I'll read it. Um, and we can try and we can try and recreate some of those things. Um, I think the the very brief um, scripting on Crow tutorial that's on in the monom.org docs. Uh, it kind of goes into creating some of the. Uh, I think so. At least I intended it to. Maybe it never got there. Um, recreating some of the source of uncertainty Buchla module um, with Crow. Um, so kind of ideas like that where it's like you don't have to recreate the whole module like piece for piece but to be able to take a, a creative idea and kind of encapsulate it in a small 
small chunk of the script. So, if you have any ideas for later in the episode, let me know and we'll, uh, we can try and create them. Uh, in terms of why it's called Cold Mac, uh, there's so many good, uh, good reasons for it and nobody's ever got it right and I'm just gonna leave it like that. So, I'm sorry, no. <laughs> Okay, um, there is a barking dog. I have the window open today because it's nice. Um, yeah, okay, so at the moment, th this patch, I I'm not sure what, so one thing I, I wish that I still use Apple computers because they have really good uh, built-in cameras, which this ThinkPad absolutely does not. Um, but it's, it's all I've got right now. So I'm sorry that the, the, the video quality is not better. Um, but this patch currently is a single mangrove, um, that's the sound generator and it's being, it's being modulated by just friends, but it's, it's passing into three, three sisters modules in parallel, um, which is pretty ridiculous, but, um, then they're all just mixing into the cold max. I'm just using this as kind of like a volume control. Um, at the moment, they're all tuned pretty close together. Um, I think we can, we can demonstrate this. Yeah, so they're all oscillating now. It's just, it's just the center band informant mode. Um, and they're all pretty much matched. So I think we're going to start doing the span thing first because it's a, a really simple, um, it's a really simple thing to do to control it. Um, I don't know if I have enough stack cables. I don't know if I have any actually, but um, we'll try and <laughs> we'll try and make it work with with this one malt that I have. Um, but basically, we're going to recreate the span control um, with with Crow really quickly. Um, it might already be obvious to you kind of how it works, but I'm just going to write like just write it out for the for the exercise of showing just how simple it is. Um, so let's make a new file. We're going to save this as span.lua. Uh, obviously, it will complain, but um, emulating OK, so the idea is input 1 is going to be frequency. And input 2 is going to be span. And we're going to say the outputs uh, one, two, three are going to equal uh, low, center, and high. So that's the that's the eight idea. Eight cold max no malt. Yeah, I know. I I deserve to be roasted for that. Um, okay, so we're going to start with an init function. Um, Maybe that's all, I don't know, we'll need to do a couple things. Um, so in order to get this to work, we need to plug in the, I'm going to use two different cold max just as, just as a big knob. So input one up here is going to be frequency. And um, this cold max down here is going to do the span control. So I'm going to set them both to zero volts for now. Um, I'm gonna turn that frequency down. Um, so in order to do this, we're gonna need to basically scan um, both of the inputs at a at a control rate. But we can do it with um, with just a single timer. Um, and the easy way for that for that is just to use the input stream mode. Um, so I'm just gonna start it on the first channel. Uh, we're, we're gonna set this mode to be. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll do it this way. So stream, and we're going to set a really fast rate. So this is every 10 milliseconds. You could go faster, but this will, this should be illustrative for our purposes. Um, it, it won't work at audio rate, but it'll be fine for kind of turning two knobs. Um, so this line's going to turn on the first input. It's going to like basically give it give it a timer um, to to trigger a reading of the input. And in order for that to work, we need to create a function to kind of receive uh, that information. So every time that 
10 millisecond timer occurs, we're going to call this function, which is going to give us a voltage. And then we're going to use that. Yeah, inside of here, we're going to basically do our whole program. Um, so that's going to mean setting the output voltage of um, three channels. So we're going to set them to all, all to zero for now. Um, and I'm just going to begin up here by um, making sure we're going to set uh, the slew time of each output to equal the same amount of time as the uh, the clock in the stream. And the, the reason we do that is basically it should give us a, a continuous kind of shape um, for every stage. Um, so yeah, between each metro tick in the stream uh, engine, we'll get like a, a, a interpolated output. So we shouldn't get kind of um, steppiness in the output. Um, oh, you can't write it that way. You have to do it like this. Okay, so we're going to upload that and it's not going to do anything. Syntax error. Does it not exist? Um, oh, I think I put this in the wrong folder. Okay, so that. Okay, there we go. Um, so it should be running right now, but it's not doing anything because we're just outputting zero volts. But we need to plug in these here, the filters, before it'll do anything. So. Pardon the cardboard box sounds. So, I'm just trying to figure out the most logical way to patch it. All of these controls are going to go straight into the frequency inputs. Uh, and excuse my reach. We said low center high. It really doesn't matter, but we'll. We'll try and do it somewhat logically. So I'm just turning the volume back up and you'll see like the oscillators haven't changed tuning and they're all still kind of pretty close together. They're not perfect, obviously, but that should work. Um, uh, okay, so. I think the next step is we're basically going to use that first input to control the frequency. So let's just apply V to all three outputs. And now we can, we're controlling all three modules uh, frequency cutoff. With this one control. Um, so that's, that's the first part. Now we need to somehow implement this the second control to do the spanning. Um, so rather than set up another timer, we, we can just directly query the input um, level. And that's going to be, uh, we'll, do it, we'll make a local variable to kind of capture that value. And you can just do it with input, uh, it's the second input and we can just ask for the vault. And the really cool thing is all we, I think all we have to do here is output one is the low frequency, so we're going to subtract span. And output three is the high frequency, so we're going to add span. And ooh, one of them is really out of tune. Which one is it? Great. That's it. That's the whole thing. Um, so now we have this control where we basically get to emulate the span control of three systems. And I think if we do it, what we what we can do here is, like, obviously on three systems, 
they're not all quite tuned together like um they're not tuned precisely to each other there's no like offsetting um but in here we could um kind of lock it to octaves so in order to do that we can just say uh, span equals the map.floor of span and that'll make, basically lock it to octaves They're not all tracking perfectly, but that's because they're kind of... Uh, these, these are the reject modules. <laughs> um, now the fun thing here is because, and this is just a, a, little, a little fun extra, this is kind of all I wanted to show, but um, because we can. I'm just going to change it into basically taking the all output of all modules. I'm sure, it's just sorting. But... So now we've got nine filters, <laughs> so it sounds like a filter bank, basically. And if we turn that uh, quantization on... Kind of get this interesting... Uh, uh, like, swarm of filters, but... We can turn we can turn them out of oscillation mode and just send some signals in. So this is just a, this is just a mangrove. It's got a little bit of modulation, but we now have this like giant mega like formanty filter. That's, that's number one. Cool. All right. Frog mode. That is exactly right. Um, so that's the first thing. I guess I guess I just really wanted to show how the real magic of Three Sisters is just this. Um, it, I mean, the filters sound nice too, but it all kind of comes down to this this idea. I think at least in formant mode, uh, the the crossover is a little different, but um, it's kind of nice when it, when you realize that it's actually pretty simple how to um kind of get that spreading effect um and i think the one cool thing that you could do here is because there's four outputs on crow you could make it five bands and you probably don't have five filters in a modular case but i think it can work with other parameters i think especially with oscillators you could do kind of detune and that's an interesting way to do that um but especially doing the the kind of quantization so and again, that's kind of that's going to change with uh, the next Crow update, which has the kind of inbuilt scale quantizing stuff. Um, but even now, you could just like wrap uh, each of each of these in like a, a function. You could call it quantize. Um, you know. uh, I always mess up my like shortcut keys. Um, but this could just be a function that quantizes a voltage. And, you know, the easy, easiest thing to do is just say um, return. You can just do the, the floor thing again to get, like, even volts, um, which, you know, as we showed before, is just, just doing this. Um, you'll probably want to add 0.5. I was talking with Dan Dirks about this today, how when you quantize something, you first need to like offset it to the middle of 
for whatever your your uh, window is. Otherwise, you never like it'll it'll be like right on the boundary of what you want and one step below it. Um, but that's for another time. But I think it would be really interesting to do um, to do that with like a, a spread on oscillators, where they would be all different, um, basically scale tones, and you could kind of like spread out your scale, uh, spread out your tones. Um, but that's another point. Ooh, I just escaped. that gave me a thought. We should do maybe next week. We should do a, a session on voicing, and kind of interesting ways on on voicing especially when you're not playing stuff on a keyboard um i think it's one of the more under considered elements of sequencing and uh, sounds and stuff but we'll get there next time because i'm not prepared to do that and i think there's some research required before that um okay so let's make a new file does anybody know how to like make a new buffer in vim without having to like make a new one then close the old one if you do don't tell me because i'll be embarrassed <laughs> i'm just kidding um okay we're gonna do we'll call it we'll just we'll call it mac because calling it cold mac is maybe like not quite true because it's only going to do a, a small set, a subset of the uh, actions so emulating a small subset of cold mac um SP. Okay, I'll keep that in mind. Why is it that SP doesn't make sense? Is it short for something? Enu. All right, this is good. I'm going to save all of your comments and decide who's 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 the most correct, which is really to say which one I like more. <laughs> um, okay, so with Cold Map, the thing I, I really want to talk about is the thing that made me design it in the first place, which is the idea of having a um, like a macro control for a, for a modular system. And specifically because, you know, a case like this, there's so many destinations for modulation that you can't possibly like have a control for every single one and know what they're all doing at the same time. That feels kind of untenable to me. Um, like my brain definitely can't manage that many different things at once. Um, so one idea uh, for kind of getting around that is to have a macro control, which allows you to sweep numerous different parameters at the same time um, with a with a simple interface into it. So I mean, if you want to think of it from a computer perspective, that's like a, it's an abstraction over a number of uh, a number of parameters. In the same way that frequency and span are an abstraction over the frequencies of three different filters. It means you can do the same with, um, you can do this, you can't do the same thing, but you can do a subset of what you can do with three knobs with two. Um, and I think you can do it in an interesting, a, a way that would be near impossible to do um, with the individual knobs. It would be to, to be able to sweep the frequency at the same time as the span. Um, I could, like to be you couldn't use all three fingers to do that. I can't imagine doing it at least. Um, so similar to that, Cold Mac has the all the outputs down the right hand side, and I'm gonna uh, pull this whole thing apart because it doesn't really make sense what we're about to do. I hope nobody's offended by the way that I pull all these cables out. Um, so one of the the irony here is we're going to use a cold Mac as the control uh, to sweep through the different functions, um, but we're just going to walk through the sequential different steps uh, in cold Mac. Let me bring up a. Oh my god. I really can't even type my own website. That's quite funny to me. I also can't find my cursor. <laughs> okay. Oh, nice. Hi, Res. Um, if we go... Yeah. 
Okay, so we're going to talk about kind of each output sequentially. Um, the first output is actually exactly the same as the input to survey added with the null. Um, but but before we do before we do this uh, piece by piece, um, the idea is you turn this control, and each output gives you an independent um, curve. Um, and so it allows you to kind of do different sets of motion and they, and they typically work in pairs. So the idea is the first two controls are like a rise and a fall um, in a way that you get this kind of crossover pattern. And there's a number of kind of natural ways of thinking about that. Um, it's like very natural to do panning, to do crossfading. Um, also to do, I mean, it's essentially the fun part of the span control is kind of the rise and the fall wrapped around a, a zero point. Um, so they work as a set together. Um, then you have the next two, which are these kind of, they're called logic functions, but they're analog. So it's kind of, it's not Boolean logic. It's like this, it's a weird subset, which is, I feel like analog logic is kind of a fake thing, but, um, it's more of a maximum and a minimum, and I think that's the kind of correct way to, to think of it, rather than and and or. It just fit better on the panel, I think. I can't remember what I was thinking four years ago when I made it. Um, but they're really interesting because you can basically say this knob is only going to affect things above 12 o'clock and below 12 o'clock. Um, which kind of feels good. Um, so you could say, like, using one to... You know, when I turn to the to the clockwise direction, I'm gonna add harmonics in this certain way, and when I go anti-clockwise, I'm gonna do the same thing for a different voice, or I'm gonna cut things away with a filter. Um, but having that twelve o'clock point be kind of a a nothing zone, like no modulation. Um, so that's one thing. You can also do interesting stuff with it at audio rate. Um, and then the this next one is an absolute value. Uh, the final one down in the first column is it's called a i call it crease um it's basically just the the input mapped to the output but it kind of wraps around so you, you kind of shift everything below five i'm uh, sorry everything below zero which is to say uh, 12 o'clock on the dial um you shift it up into the positive region whereas before it was in the negative and everything in the positive you shift it down uh, and that gives you this discontinuity around that kind of that middle zone um, I think it, it's interesting. It has a it has a kind of nice and bizarre wave shaping um, sound to it, but I think it's also it's cool to be able to maintain the the right slope to match the kind of the traditional knob movement, but to have it operate in two different zones than you would expect with just a linear range. Um, then there's also these other two outputs which are um, temporal which is to say they're about time. Um, the first one is a, it's called follow. It's just an envelope follower, essentially. Um, it's, I just, uh, I just stole the circuit from the up 2600. <laughs> um, because it's, it's a nice thing. So it basically just like adds some slew to everything. Um, but it's also full wave rectified, which is the same as the absolute value in this control next to it. And then the final control location is, uh, an integrator, right? So it will take the, it will basically treat the dial or the CV as an, as a velocity. And it will kind of track, it'll keep, it'll move in that direction. Where, so it's, if it's a little bit positive, it'll move slowly positive. It's in a slow, it's slowly hitting the gas. And if it's negative, um, you'll slowly start reversing back down and it'll, it'll be clamped at plus five and minus five. So that's the general idea. You can't control how fast that is, that you only control it by what the voltage is. But uh, I think we can recreate all of these functions in probably one line each. Um, so maybe the best way to do that is let's just make a bank of functions that their, in their arguments are an input voltage which is 
hmm, what is it going to be? It's really just, there's only one in, there's only one argument. It's just the input. Um, and then the output is going to be some transformed, uh, transformed version of input. So we're going to write one for each row. Um, and then let's see how far we can get with that. So the first is, it's called left on the panel. So we'll just start with that. Um, it's going to take a V for voltage and it's going to return surprise V. So it, it takes in one value and it returns the exact same value. Um, so that's, that's a really nice, easy one. Um, next we've got right. Um, and the trick here is it's minus V. So plus one becomes minus one. Really basic. Um, next we have or, which uh, Lua doesn't like us to use, so we'll make it capital R. Um, and the thing here is, or really takes two, two levels in, as inputs, but in our context with, with just using the dial like this to do what I called patch surveillance, um, it's really just treating that number, the, the second number as zero volts. So it's saying, um, or should give us the maximum of two inputs. So it'll be math um, seal, which is the ceiling of volts and zero. Um, now, and it's gonna be very similar and it's going to be math floor. And that's gonna give us the lower of two values um, of V and zero. That's correct. Um, next, we get to do... On the panel, it's called slope, um, which really... I'm not entirely sure why. <laughs> if somebody wants to uh, inform me why I made that decision, I'm all ears. Um, and in this case, we get to do another fancy mathematical function, which is called absolute. So the absolute value will just basically give, turn a negative into a positive value, but positive stays positive. Um, so it's just going to be the absolute of V. And then we have crease. Now, how does this work? Um, so we want to maintain the right voltage, but if we're below zero, we want to add five volts. And if we're above zero, we want to subtract five. So we can do that with a ternary function, which is to say, it's kind of doing a conditional in one line of code. Um, and so essentially we're gonna return the voltage and that's gonna maintain our slope, uh, our gradient. Um, but then we wanna do, we wanna conditionally um, add or subtract some offset. Um, so let's say plus, and now we get to do our ternary, which is going to say, if the voltage is greater than zero, and then in Lua, um, you use basically and to be the first result. So if the if the conditional is true, then and will be true. Um, and that basically is again doing a logic thing because the conditional is true and basically says. Um, if there is any value here other than nil and will result in true if the conditional was true. So we can write our value and then otherwise it'll basically evaluate through into the or um, section because the conditional was not true. Therefore the thing after and never gets evaluated and we move straight on to the or path. Um, so if the voltage is above zero, we're going to add negative five. So that's actually gonna subtract five um, or we're going to add five volts to a negative value. And that's the crease. Um, the time-based ones are a little more difficult. So let's, um, let's kind of leave them for now, but um, we can, let's try these out just to, just to make sure. So let's say, let's get an init function. 
we're going to do the exact same thing as last time, which is to treat um, the first input as a continuous voltage. And we're going to, again, sample it at 0 0.01, um, which is 10 milliseconds. And we're going to now define our event for the input stream, which is going to give us a voltage. And we're going to assign that to an output. Um, so let's do output one to start with. Um, I'm going to jump back up here and add the add that uh, automatic slew time again, or, or that setting of the slew time. So again, equaling um, this time value so that they kind of line up. And we're going to set output one voltage to equal whatever our function we choose um, with the voltage passed in. So let's start with left, which is really just echoing the input to the output. Uh, but hopefully this will work. Okay, it says we're running. Um, now, so I'm just using a, a mangrove here. Um, and the goal, yeah, so now we have uh, this, this kind of control here, which is attached to the input number one. Um, is driving output number one, and it's turning up the the um, sorry, it's turning up the air control voltage to increase the volume of this mangrove. Um, so let's rather than um, just change it, let's just add a couple extra voltages. So why don't we say? Um, two, three, and four. So we can have one be right. Let's do slope and we'll do crease as well. So they're all gonna take that same input voltage V and they're going to apply a different function to it. Um, so volume's still working. Next we have basically the inverse. So as I turn the volume up, something's not good about crease, but we'll get there. Um, so as I'm turning up the volume, it's turning down the formant control. Uh, next. Crease isn't going to work, so we'll come back to that. But slope should still work. Um, and we can use that to control... I guess barrel is the obvious one. Ooh, why don't we change this? So instead, we're going to control... Uh, we're going to take the, the air control out. And we're, instead, we're going to control that with uh, this absolute value. So now 12 o'clock is going to be zero. And either direction is going to give us some volume. Um, I just attached left to the barrel control. So we get these like two totally different timbres on either side of the control. Um, lastly, we have this issue with crease. I'm curious here. Um, okay, let's look at this error. Uh, that might. Hopefully that will uh, help us solve the uh, solve the question. Attempt to perform arithmetic on a Boolean value. Um, I think we just maybe that we need some uh, extra parentheses here. 
Yeah, there we go. Okay, the, the problem solved. Um, and so now we get to control, we use this last crease output to do something interesting, which could be... Why don't we uh, attach this second mangrove as a frequency modulating input? And we're going to use the crease to control the format control on this mangrove here. So that's going to give us an interesting, at least hopefully interesting, uh, different set of characteristics. So you can hear here, it's giving off that discontinuity between the like grumbly low sound to that like quite high raspy kind of FM sound. Ta-da! Okay, um, that's kind of all I wanted to do with the, the kind of emulation of Cold Mac, just because it's, there's a lot to it, but I think that's like kind of the main, the main characteristic. So, that, I mean, that's what, that what is what created the idea. Nutritional Zero is asking about the genesis of Cold Mac. And the reality is, uh, I, I had that idea of a macro control. Uh, and I started basically laying out a number of functions that I thought would be interesting. Um, and in doing that, figuring out the implementation uh, from an electronics per perspective um, made me realize that each of these functions that I wanted to um, have it do were themselves interesting circuits. and. Most of the time, they only needed one or two extra jacks um, to enable them to be used as isolated blocks. So that's where it started from. It was originally it was just going to be the the right column of jacks, um, and then because I've been doing the, the diagonal layout, which is kind of uh, it's it's how I was doing like the control voltage stuff. Um, like all the CV inputs on Mangrove and Three Sisters, um, they had that um, uh, corrugated pattern. Uh, it basically put me in a position where I had the survey input and then all these rows like this, and I was like, well, there's one more output, what should it be? And that's where this idea came about of having a Mac, which, which really comes from the DSP concept of multiply accumulate, um, which is kind of how you do convolution and things. But it's it's very similar to how you how you make a mixer. You just don't have to do it all um, all together. So the Mac, it made sense to be like, well, it can just be the addition of everything down the left side. Um, and that it, it is AC coupled, which is hopefully that means that you can um, you can still send in control voltage signals in that left column and have them not dominate the output. They won't like completely shift everything. Um, but yeah, I mean, that, that was the idea of the Mac and it was just like, well, cool, we can just add a VCA and now it's like a mixer, even though it only has a global level. It doesn't have a per channel level. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's the kind of genesis of it, I guess. The I think the follow and the location outputs, uh, the envelope follower, I was really hoping to get in there. Um, because to me, it's a really interesting um, perspective. Perspective is wrong. It's an interesting function to have, and to and to you don't really always need um, a whole module with like attack and decay times and like everything like this to do a to do an envelope follower. You really just have like a, a typical one, and then if you want to get fancy, you can use a, a more powerful um, slew generator module. And there's plenty of those to choose from. But this was like, well, I can add one jack to this module I'm already building. 
and it can have a envelope follower. And I think the location came about just because I, once I put the envelope follower in, I was like, I want it to have some characteristic that is temporal. Um, that's more than just like a slew that is envelope following. Um, and that's kind of one thing I find really interesting about Cold Mac is like using the location control and especially using it uh, in feedback. Um, I'm still convinced that there's a way to make it oscillate with, uh, with, with, without just there's like a, there's a noisy oscillation that people are playing with um, in kind of some some things around that. I think with two, it's really easy. You can just plug location into the crease input and then feed that back, feed it across back the other module into survey. Um, but just wanting to have that like lots of different uh, transfer functions and then have some element that makes it um, kind of structured in time. So that's the kind of the kind of origin. Uh, what's going on? What are people saying? The black modules? They're, they're, well, there's one. They're mostly purple. Um, this is an old Buchla thing I was playing with. It's all just like prototypey stuff. It's nothing, nothing that will ever be uh, a product. Um, Order of operations. Oh, someone's asking, do I need the parentheses um, here? These, you absolutely do not. I like to put them in whenever I'm doing an inline conditional, uh, when it's not the only thing between like an if and a then, just because I find it easier to kind of recognize that's what it is. Um, that's, that's all. Um, Inside baseball. <laughs> Cold Mac and Malt makes it oscillate, right? <laughs> yeah, I don't have. If only I had more than one Malt, we could we could make eight oscillators. Um, wait, we can try that patch really quickly. I think it, it could be fun. Um, we'll do. I I think these ones up here work. <laughs> it's, so it's going to be the location decrease. And then the output of crease back into crease. I think, I hope this will oscillate. Oh, sorry. Somehow. These cold max might not even work. I'm not sure. They're just. Perhaps I've misunderstood the patch. Oh, because this no longer works. We have to plug this into survey. I'm not sure if you can hear that. It's definitely oscillating, but uh, I guess it's too quiet. It seems surprising that it wouldn't be blisteringly loud, but I guess, I guess it's not. Anyway, that was a nice idea. We'll get there one day. Somebody will figure it out. Um, is there a way to make Cold Mac into a wave folder? Um, not in the traditional, like, frequency multiplication sense um or like yeah when it like passes over a threshold it'll flip it back down you, you might be able to do something but you'd probably need like three of them um which seems like mega overkill for doing wave folding maybe i'll do i'll do one week i'll just do 
uh, like a hundred patches with callback. <laughs> um, but yeah, we'll figure that out. Um, okay. Um, well, let's move on. So, um, So there's a couple things here. Um, the first is that um, when we look at this file over here, we have this big set of functions. And I think that there's um, something to be said about having like a number of uh, small functional blocks like this that kind of do a category of the same thing, but slightly different. Um, one thing that's really interesting is basically being able to assign them dynamically. So at the moment, we have to change the code down here um, to like apply a different function. But one thing we could do instead um, is we could do it with a table. And I think this is kind of an interesting thing where you can get into, um, to get into, how do you say, you could kind of get into sequencing of the different functions. and. And rather than have a cold Mac that is, you know, all the, it's six rows of functions that are all always going to be um, the same thing. You know, one input's always going to the same output. Um, using a coded version, like a Crow style version, you can kind of dynamically reassign those things. And so every, you know, you could put that on a timer, so on, or as as part of a sequence where each step through, you would like, you could cycle or something all the different pieces. Um, so we could make a table of the different functions and, or maybe better than that. Yeah. Rather than a table of the functions themselves, we could have a table, which are the outputs. I'm still not sure this is necessary. Um, but we could have a list. And now the cool thing is done, uh, we should call this a, something better than the list. We'll call it F list for function list. Um, and now we have a number here that can kind of choose and we could just do this and that'll kind of index into our value, but that's just made everything more opaque, which I don't think is the um, desire here. But we could then kind of have like a, um, a, a mapping table where you could say the um, out functions. Again, these names are not very good, but. Um, and like now you could have a table that kind of like lists as. Ah, as I'm typing this, I'm realizing it's not actually helping us at all. Why don't we. We could, why don't we sequence it? That feels like something more interesting. Um, so in order to do that, we need to have like a, some kind of time base. Um, I'm trying to decide if this is actually what, what we should be working on. Um, so Maybe you can let me know in the comments. Like one thing, like maybe there's a couple of different kind of paths we can go down. One is this idea of sequencing functions, which I feel like we've covered on some point um, in the past. Um, and another thing we can do is just kind of come up with new functions um, to kind of extend the extend the range of things we can do. So we can do stuff that cold Mac can't. We can kind of have this like big list of utility functions, and then you can just kind of customize your own um, you can customize your script by just basically assigning the right function that you want into the output channel, mapping input to output. Um, this does feel like last week's unfinished sequencer, which I still haven't finished. Um, well, I kind of did, but, uh, it required a change to the firmware because of some things that were broken. Um, so I 
I don't want to spend too long. Um, extend callback, yeah. Um, but I think if we just have a bunch of utility functions, um, these are all one input, one output functions, but we could ostensibly try some two input, one output, or two input, two output functions. Um, and then it's kind of a, it's a, it's a natural um, combination, I think, of the like synthesizer bits and the coding language. You know, like when you talk about code, you're often thinking in functions. You're thinking in, um, you know, a, a black box that does a thing with an input and gives you an output. Um, so I think that is like a, an interesting way to think about it. Um, so yeah, why don't we think about what other functions we could have here? Um, so the question is, what can we do? So uh, maybe one thing we can look at is, you'll note here that a number of these functions are just, uh, they're just from the, the math library in Lua. Um, the integrator, uh, yeah, we can do that. Okay, so let's make a list of things we want to do. So math functions, um, time functions, so integrator, but we can also do the inverse, so differentiator. Um, and one thing I would love to touch on is chaos functions. Um, they're typically going to be Sometimes I don't even need an input, but it can be like an offset. Um, so yeah, we can do, we can at least do one. I want to look at the gingerbread man um, chaotic map. Um, so let's look at math functions. Um, now the, the easiest way to do this is Lua math functions. <laughs> math library, love it. Look at this. It's it's ripe fodder for playing with. Um, so there's lots of fun stuff here. So, oh, one thing that I think is really interesting and, and it's really cool that Crow can do is um, tri trigonometry. And like, that's sure you'd be like, oh, math. Um, but just doing sine functions and cos functions and tan, um, you can do really interesting stuff. You can also do it to map Cartesian coordinates into polar coordinates, um, which I think is perhaps a really interesting, um, an interesting task. I don't know that I can do that on the fly, but uh, let's write it down. Um, cut to pole. And pole to cut. Um, but is there anything else here? Let me know if you'd see anything you want to play with. Division is something that's really difficult in analog. Um, so why don't we try a division function? We'll do like a one over the input voltage. Wow, that was so easy. I love it. Um, what's a cool synth thing you could use the trig functions for? That is a good question. Um, I think that one thing that it would allow you to do is use a, a different control interface. So if you have a per, if you have a set of parameters that you could think about as x y, um, maybe that's like the frequency and span control of three sisters rather than controlling them independently as like frequency and, and uh, span, you could instead have them as like a, a polar thing where you say, you basically describe a vector of like, do I want to be, like, you could have like a magnitude and, a, and an angle and it'll just give you a different way of controlling that same set of stuff. Um, wave shaping is the most obvious. You could also do wave shaping. That would be cool. I, 
one of the hard things about Crow is that it's typically only operating at a control rate. Um, so it's hard to do audio rate functions that add a lot of harmonics because they're going to get lost in the, the low sample rate that you're going to be operating at. But definitely wave shaping of LFOs, that is very true. Um, let's listen to this division function. I have no idea what it's going to work, how to, if it's even going to work. Um, we'll definitely get like a divide by zero, but I think, I think Lua will take care of that for us. So, um, that's currently on the barrel control, but I think that's, let's make it have something more interesting. Let's control the pitch. All right, that's really high. This seems, seems to, seems to, seems to not be doing the thing, right? <laughs> oh, it's because we're, this clearly doesn't make sense. Yeah, okay, so this is an interesting idea. It's kind of like crease. Um, so we're taking the number one and we're dividing it by the value of an input voltage. So this is one over five. As we approach zero, it's going to go to infinity, which is going to be this like high spot. And that's really low. <laughs> so if you know the, the one the one over x graph, can I do this with my hands? It, it's uh, this one, where you have this piece down here, and then invert, and in, you have like this one up here. looks like this and so you can hear that with the pitch so that's a that's a something I don't know if that's interesting but uh it's it's something that you'll very rarely see in a modular system because typically that stuff is um only it's not really possible in analog or if it is it's like really inaccurate and it won't do negative values like that just did um it'll only give you that one quadrant up the top um so that's one how what else could we do i like doing these things that are kind of not typically possible in the analog realm just because they're more interesting but we can also do other stuff so why don't we um why don't we look at these time functions um, so, let's try and write an integrator. I'm going to give myself the, the luxury of more than one line, because uh, it might make it easier to think about. Um, so if we look up, this is often how I like figure out how to implement something, is just look at the Wikipedia page, or math is fun, that sounds like a good idea. Integration. Okay, so area under the curve, that's what you can think of it as. Um, so it's basically going to be um, we're going to be like adding more and more space under the curve. So if we set, so in this graph here, if the input voltage was set down at this level and it stayed there, the area under the curve would continue to grow, you know, because this graph extends out uh, infinitely in time. So the longer we stay there, the more um, area under the cur area under the graph under the curve. That phrase really doesn't make sense. I don't know why they teach that to kids. Um, but in order to implement that, let's let's do this uh, DSP integration algorithm. This is stuff that you. Like a lot of people will just know. 
how to write this, but sometimes it's nice to know that you can just search. And as I say that, I'm having a hard time finding a simple version. Um, but I kind of want it to... No, this is not at all what we need. I guess I can just tell you what it is, even though that doesn't feel like it's as interesting. Why didn't 1 over 0 throw an error? Uh, because Lua just calls it infinite, and I think when you send an infinite value out and it gets clamped to a value, it's going to be clipped at... I think it's going to get clipped at 10 by the D, by the hardware, so it'll, it won't throw an error. That's a terrible explanation, I'm sorry. <laughs> an integrator, I believe, is going to be... We're going to need a state in here um, to remember something. So um, we could make a local value in here, but I think it's gonna, that's going to get overwritten every time we call this. So instead, we need um, an, an, uh, uh, a variable. It can be local to this function, or to this uh, file. Um, but it can't be local to this function, because then it'll just get overwritten every time. But um, we'll just keep it global, because then I don't have to worry if I'm wrong. Um, so, in order to figure this out, we're going to say, we're going to return a value, which is kind of what all these functions have to do, which is going to be... Um, It's like one of these things where it's like the last one plus some multiplier by the first one. So if we say give it some value, let's make it even smaller. And we get we have to update this value. So why don't we say last integral equals that, and then we'll return last. I don't know if this is correct. Um, integrator. But it, it'll hopefully make some sound. Yeah, all right. So I set the, the vault, the, this callback knob to be as close to zero as I can get it to 12 o'clock. And it's pretty much staying still. It might be moving a little bit, but yeah, it's climbing slowly. But if I turn it down, it'll kind of track downwards until I stop it. So, so it becomes kind of like a, a ball that's rolling around, and a positive voltage moves it this way, and a negative one moves it this way. <laughs> um, and... There's no inherent clipping here, um, which means that if we let it run off the bottom, um, it'll take a really long time to come back up because it's now like at like negative thirty volts or something. So we could add a well, we can add a clip in here, um, and I know there's a there's probably a library function to do this, but we can just say equals. We'll use another ternary statement. And now I wish I had a shorter variable name. Um, if it is greater than 5, then we should return 5. This is probably going to look easier if we just use it as an if. Um, So now we should be able to come back up really quickly. Um, Math.min, no, absolutely you could use that. Um, realistically, I'd just wrap it in a 
function anyway and call it clamp. I know that no one's already has that by default, um, which would just be like I mean, this is almost another function we could use, <laughs> even though it's just a helper in our case. Um, so yeah, we could do it like this, where this was v. Um, Etc. But yeah, you're right. I think it's easier if we if we return the maximum of higher of v, v and min, and then we can, basically we're gonna wrap this v value in a map min. This gets a little confusing to look at, um, but I believe that's correct. Oh, we're not even calling it, so this won't do anything. Um, last integral equals All right, well, it's because there's no value here. Okay, there you go. So that's the integrator. Um, is there a stats package in Lua? No, there is not, as far as I'm aware, but I am likely wrong. Um, okay, so I think the differentiator So all we did here for the integrator was we took kind of a running um, We had like a, a, a state variable that we were kind of moving each time To do a differentiator um, what we're looking for is the difference between, well, basically looking at the, the gradient of the input. Um, so at the most extreme, that's a high pass filter. Uh, you can use it as a high pass filter, um, but it'll only let through changes. Um, so a static value will return to zero. Um, to do that, we're also going to need a variable. Uh, um, a state variable, but I think we have to say what the last um, input value was, rather than the last output value. Um, differentiator. It's an output. I'm like butterfingers today on the keyboard. Um, So we probably need a local variable here. So we're going to make an output, and that's going to be... Basically, we're going to look at the difference between the last two stages. I think... So this is going to be doing it absolutely between each, sta each step, um, which is kind of one way. But I think if you do it as an average, it, it'll make it smoother and more interesting. But let's just get through this so we can kind of keep going with some more fun stuff. Um, so it's going to be the difference between um, the input minus the last input, so the change in input. Um, so if, if we're turning it up, v is going to be bigger than last input, so it'll be a positive value, whereas if we're turning it down, it's going to be the inverse, so it'll be a v will be Uh, smaller than last input, so last input should dominate, and because it's subtracted, it'll be a negative value. That seems right. Um, then we'll save our current input into last input, and we will return the out value. Uh, let's Ta-da! 
Um, that to me is not very interesting. I think it really needs some smoothing and it needs to have like a time constant. Um, but I think it's kind of beyond the capacity of my small brain today. Um, let's look at another stateful, um, another stateful function, but this one's going to be chaotic. This is going to use, uh, the gingerbread man map. So I'm going to call a function ginger just for simplicity. We'll give it a voltage because it needs to take one, but I don't know what we're going to do with it yet. Um, but in order to do this, let's look up. Um, I already have this one open. So one of the cool things um, that I like to do is just like look at like different um, mathematical kind of areas and, and not even math. You can do there's really interesting like nature stuff as well, which often there's like mathematical um, modelings of. Like in the um, in the Bowery package, there's a script called Boyd's, which is um, a play on the bird flocking algorithm. It's only in one dimension, but um, it kind of like tries to take some natural living world um, behavior and model it. Um, so often they do like visualizations with it, but I was like, oh, what if we do control voltage? I've, it's really sensitive to, to the values, and I don't think I ever got them quite right, but um, I think that's a really interesting thing to explore. But one thing that's great is there is, on Wikipedia, um, there's this a category called Chaotic Maps, and it's just a big list of all these different chaos functions. Um, so you, people are probably familiar with, I think, the Duffing map. This has this like classic kind of two two different oscillation zones, and it'll kind of jump between the two. Uh, and there's another, the Lorenz attractor is another very, like, um, commonly seen one. Looks like this. It also has a nice, like, butterfly-looking appearance. Um, but yeah, this stuff is, I don't know, it seems really interesting, and there's a lot of, like, room to kind of use it musically, I think. Um, most of the time, oh, this is even better. There's a list here. They have this um, categorized list, which has these different uh, parameters here. And typically, when you, you there's some modules out there that do analog chaos functions, um, and I think they're great and they're really interesting. But they can be hard to model uh, in a digital space because doing continuous time things in a discrete time, which is digital um, model can be hard. But one thing they, that's really hard to do in analog is stuff that is inherently discrete. So if you put this time domain, if you order it by that, and you just skip past all this continuous stuff, and you look at the discrete ones, they're like really easy typically to implement um, in a system like Crow. And I really like the gingerbread man map because one, it looks like a gingerbread man. It's really cute. Um, but it also is cool because the, the points like jump rather than like continuously moving between values. Um, and so I think it could be a really interesting, uh, jumping off point for a sequencer. Um, and basically this is going to be a bit hard without a, um, without a scope. I tried to plug mine in, but with my camera, it's like not good enough to really capture the, um, the the lines, but we'll try and demonstrate it with maybe two oscillators with their pitch changing. Um, but you'll see here, the equation's really simple. Um, it's just, it's just this here. So the Y value is just the previous X value and the X value is one minus the previous Y plus the absolute value of the last X. Um, so I wish I could copy and paste that straight into Lua, but I'm going to have to kind of tab back and forth. Oh, we can move it onto the page. Uh, okay. Now I'm inside of Wikipedia. So uh, we have our function ginger. So let's make two local variables. So, and we're going to need to 
save sum as well. So last x and last y. So this is going to give us two dimensions of output, but we only this function is only really allowed to return us one right now. So we'll just we'll just return one, and then we we might kind of refactor this stuff to be able to return multiple values. Um, so let's set the last x value. Oh, we can't do that yet. Um, we need two local, the x and the y. So y just equals last x, and x equals one minus last y plus math abs of last x. That's it. I think that's the whole thing. Um, then all we have to do is manage the state. So last x equals x, and last y equals y. And then we should return one of them. Um, I mean, we can return both. It'll just, the second one will get ignored. Um, these need to be initialized. Um, and I know, I think the value that you initialize them to um, drastically changes what their what the outputs can be, um, but uh, it might even say um, this doesn't tell you. I was looking at a thing before that did, but um, let's not worry about it for now. Uh, so let's just try it out. Let's see what happens. Um, all right, so it's oscillating. Um, what is a bit difficult about that is it's so fast. Why don't we, because what that means is every time we're sampling the input value, we're calculating the next stage of the chaotic map. Um, so if we just slow down, let's do it 10 times a second rather than a hundred times. But we're slewing between all the values. So let's turn that off. Okay, so that sounds like it's going 0, 1, 2. Um, 0, 1, 2, 1. So it's just an oscillator right now. Um, so typically, the way you control... Um, the way you control this particular oscillator is by changing the origin. And so the origin for us is these, these initial values for last x and last y. So if we change this to be... 0.1 for last x. I'm guessing it'll change it very slightly. Or maybe it'll like totally go off in a, on the, in the dis into the distance. All right, so you can see like it's basically totally changed the sequence. Um, one thing that we can do, and I think it might be an interesting way to get some CV control over this, is if we use the V value from the input, so this is basically whatever this knob is set to, um, we'll just add it to the previous x value. So this is CV control. So now everywhere I turn this knob, it's gonna basically have a different sequence. And you'll see like this one, the sequence is way longer. And it's maybe not identical every time, but it's pretty similar. And then I think you plug this into a, into a quantizer. I mean, that's, I feel like that's going to sound pretty interesting. With these chaos things though, they because they're based on memory, um, they can uh, run away to a point where they're kind of not useful. It's got a nice swing to it. So one thing we did here is we uh, we're returning both the x and the y value. So this is something 
a lot of languages can't do. Um, and it's new to me. I, I never really worked with a language that can do multiple return values. But the way Lua treats this is it will use the first one as the return value. Like basically for every extra place you, you give the function to put values, it'll just use as many as it can. Um, so down here, we call the ginger function, but we only have one output to capture that, which is the output number one. But we can also, um, using a comma, we can do this. And that's going to allow us to capture both outputs and plug them into output one and output two. So this should be identical to before. Um, I turned the frequency down, hence it's a bit different. But um, let's use a second oscillator to um, to try and demonstrate them. Demonstrate the. The relationship. All right, so these two are just uh, tuned to match each other in frequency. So we should be able to hear basically as a um, as a duet. We'll be hearing the gingerbread map. Pretty strange. <laughs> um, so one thing we could do here to kind of try and constrain it a bit and make it a bit more musical um, is we could, um, when we're like sending these outputs, we could add a clamp to say, um, maintain them inside of a particular voltage range. Um, that's one thing we could do. We could wrap it so that values beyond a certain octave get flipped down to a lower one. And we could do that just as a shaping or we could do it as part of the algorithm, which will change the gingerbread man algorithm. Um, so to do that, we would do it basically on X and Y here. So that would be to uh, change the algorithm. X and y. Um, or down here, we could just um, shape the output without affecting the algorithm. Um, so let's just start down here. I, all I want to do is basically say, um, I think the easiest thing to do is just to do it on this value. Let's say, let's just call it wrap. I'm going to apply the same function to both. And that function um, going to say if if b is greater than let's say three volts um, there's always a better way <laughs> uh, v equals v minus one so i'm just going to shift it down an octave then i'm going to say uh, plus one i'm going to use a modular to kind of wrap it. Oh, that's only going to work with integers, though. There's always... I never quite know how to implement this stuff. If v is greater than 3, then v minus 3. Else if v is less than...
gloriously eternal. <laughs> um, what version is on here? I don't know what that means. Um, so a similar thing we could do uh, as like a, a modifier is we could apply a quantizer. Um, but let's, let's kind of leave that for now. I think it's maybe an interesting control voltage, maybe more than um, pitch. So now I've, I've just like basically plugged them in directly. Um, uh, sorry, I've attached those control voltages to the formant input. Um, I'm just kind of hacking this back to being the way it was. Um, and then the next, the other thing I want to do is be able to control the the rate that that, that that's updating. Um, let's not worry about that. I don't know. It might still be broken. Um, So it's kind of like an automatic sequencer. The gingerbread is coming to catch. Very good. Um, this is definitely getting a little bit away from this extended cold mac idea. But maybe that's fine. Okay, so one thing we can do, let's uh, kind of wrap this up together. So um, what we have at the moment is a bunch of functions that can take an input and give us an output. Um, and we can do, we have four outputs, so we could have four of those running at once. Um, but maybe what we can try and do is basically use one knob as our input value, so that could be one control voltage input um, as our value, and then have a second one a second input, uh, which is going to be the other cold Mac knob, like like before, um, which is going to choose which algorithm to apply, and it's going to kind of cycle us through the different options. Um, and I think that that'll be a direct control with a physical knob, but um, it'll allow us to um, kind of imagine what you could do with a sequence. You could sequence it uh, with control with a control voltage. Um, but you could also obviously do it in Crow. But um, let's just uh, attach, I'm gonna basically connect this cold Mac back to input two, um, and then use it to select the mapping of the kind of input processing function. So to do that, um, I'm gonna clean things up a little bit here by just like dumping some stuff down the bottom. So we can leave, we'll leave the integral and the differentiator. And let's get rid of the gingerbread man for now, just because uh, it's not in this, it's not really quite the same thing as the rest of them. But we have this big list of functions. Um, and what we want to do is basically have a number that can choose which one of them to do. 
Um, oh, right. So the, the really cool way to do this is rather than... Um, rather than make a table that indexes them, we can just do this. My funds, my functions, equals by just putting everything inside the table. We're going to have to pull these variables out. Uh, there's different ways we could do that, but that's kind of the, the quick way. And that's the end of our table. <laughs> um, I think this should run. Yeah, there we go. So what we've done here, it, it seems bizarre, um, and maybe it is, um, but we've taken all of these functions. I mean, clamp doesn't make sense. Let's pull that outside. Um, and we've just put them directly into a table. Um, so we've given them... Oh, the names don't matter. But because there there aren't names for these values in this table, they're just going to be given sequential indexes. So this line is going to be number one. This will be number two. Uh, I can't even use the keyboard. That'll be number three, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so what we can do is to make sure this is working correctly, we can just print the length of the table. So this should say. Ooh, nil value. Did we run it? Wow. Okay. So maybe maybe this isn't possible. They all have names right now, um, which might be the issue. So we could just do this, which is going to make them very opaque. Um, but maybe that was what the problem was. Yeah. Okay. So... Unfortunately, you can't do it like this and name all your functions. They have to be what are called anonymous functions, um, meaning functions without a name. Um, we could... So what was happening then is they were basically given um, names. The, na so the names that they are accessible by are these things. So I would have to say um, print my funds dot left still doesn't work I didn't re-upload it I'm not a great Lua teacher apparently <laughs> but if we allow ourselves this luxury which is to say stupidity of not having a name we can just index these directly and that's going to make it really easy to just choose which function we want to use. My funds with some number. So we're going to call it I for now. Um, and V. And so let's say instead of the number I, uh, we're going to use the value at the input jack. That's going to be a continuous voltage. And we have nine options, so we kind of want to use, uh, we want to shape this a bit. So we know that input voltage can be minus 5 to plus 10 volts. Cold max is only going to give us minus 5 to plus 5. So why don't we say we'll subtract 5. We'll subtract 6, actually, because um, the indexes should start from number 1. Um, and we're going to go down to negative 5. So we'll take that number, we'll subtract 6, and then we will take the floor of that value. So that's going to kind of round down to the negative direction. Um, and then hopefully, this needs to be input 2. Hopefully this will run. Oh, oh, oh. Um, what does this error mean? Attempt to call a nil value. Oh, there's nothing to compare it against. Um, floor is not what we need. We need round. But that's not a function. 
What's it called? How do I make it an integer? This should be really... I'm having a, a blank. Two integer, let's do that. Um, no? Math.seal? Won't that be the same problem? I'm trying to turn a floating point number into an integer. Oh, it's because it's two. I made this mistake earlier today. It's got to be plus six. Okay, cool. <laughs> so now, um, we're currently only controlling this one input here. Um, that should be it. So one thing that I've done here, um, I slowed down the uh, the scan rate to only ten times a second. Let's let's put it back up. And let's get rid of that print so we can actually see if there's other errors. Okay, so we don't really know what function we're using at the moment, but. Um, we can see from like just playing with it that this is the this should be the crease function I think. So we're decreasing until negative five, and then we jump up to five plus five. But if I turn this knob down here, the second cold mark, we've got a different function. This is just a regular old left. Um, yeah, so... Now I'm using this con this knob to basically choose the different functions on the fly. So I'm kind of reconfiguring what this value is being applied to. So that's the thing. I feel like if you sequenced that, that could be interesting. We could try it with, uh, we have a Just Friends here, so we can just do a sequential sequence. Um, this is pretty... some errors because we're out of range. Um, that's only using one output. So we could kind of do that same thing but just like rotate everything one. Um, so why don't we just say like plus one, plus two, and minus one. I don't know why. But, um, this will probably have a lot of errors but they're all pretty harmless. Thank you. 
So much high frequency. I guess we can just low toss it. And so now we're using, we're just using like a basic LFO out of Just Friends, you could use anything. And it's, it's just choosing the sequencing of functions. So we can change the wave shape here to change the way that it sounds moving through those functions. So again, it's like a lot of this stuff you're going to need to kind of massage it into music. But the cool thing here is like this whole patch is being controlled by the two cold Mac knobs and, and the wave shape and the speed of the Just Friends. And I think that that kind of gives you a kind of interesting like um, perspective into your synthesizer, you know, and like. Again, like we're doing all of this with Crow and with the modular synth, but like you can do the same stuff in, in Maxim SP or in Super Collider. It's kind of just taking that idea of like taking a small set of inputs and like how can we multiply them out. And I think doing this stuff here, it's like, um, I don't know, it's like a really fun and new way, I think. I don't think there's a lot of people that have really been experimenting with this idea of um, changing a mapping in terms of functions on the fly. You know, it's like, that's basically like repatching through your synthesizer on the go. And, and there's things that do it in, in analog sense, like um, sequential switches and stuff like that. Um, but they tend to be super low level and they're like very, they have to be very bare bones because they're implemented in analog. It makes it very difficult to do more complex stuff. Um, but this, this just feels like a nice way to be able to explore kind of shifting characteristics and shifting zones. Um, so I think there's, I don't know, it feels like there's a lot of, uh, room to explore it and kind of make it more interesting. Um, but I think that's going to kind of wrap it up for today. I wish there was a more musical example to end on. Um, maybe next time I'll have all the, uh, all the quantizing stuff finished in Crow, so we can um, hopefully keep things a little bit more kind of tonal in some way, and maybe look a bit more at the music theory stuff and the voicing ideas. Um, but I hope this has been kind of illustrative in terms of the idea of using like a functional mindset. Um, and that means one thing to computer programmers, but um, just this idea that you can take any input and depend, and you just have to process it in a certain way. That's what a filter does. That's what a wave folder does. That's what a VCA does. They just have different kinds of functions. Um, but typically, you know, those functions are, um, you know, a VCA is just a multiplier. Um, but we don't see things like dividers and we don't see things like square root functions in a modular synth. So this is kind of an interesting way to bring in a bunch of different kind of concepts around that um i'm just gonna have a read through the comments and uh if you have any last questions or anything if there's any more like 
bits and pieces you want to look at, um, we can do that before we sign up. I feel like we're in a, a Psytrance club right now. It's me, it's me Aflu, is the name? Um, the TXO is already working. I thought it was already in the main firmware, but maybe it's still waiting for the next release, but it'll come very soon. Uh, I'm going to stop the recording, but I'll still hang around for a little while, so thanks everybody. 